I'm Marston Lenahan. I'm the chief of urologic surgery at the National Cancer Institute. We're going to talk about the genetic basis of kidney cancer. And the reason that's important to us as urologic surgeons is because understanding the genes that cause kidney cancer help us be better surgeons, depending on which type of surgery, which type of operation we want to do for a particular patient, also help us understand how these cancers are formed and are the basis for therapy for patients with localized as well as advanced disease. I have no disclosures. And kidney cancer affects over 400,000 patients worldwide every year and causes nearly 200,000 deaths. In the US, about 75,000 patients are diagnosed every year with 15,000 deaths. Now, when we started nearly 30 years ago, we knew that we could cure most people with localized disease. About 95% survived uh, five years with a nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy. However, patients who presented to us with advanced disease, 81% of those patients died after 24 months. So we wanted to understand the genetic basis of kidney cancer. And when we started working, kidney cancer was a single disease. We did the same operation on every patient with kidney cancer. And we treated patients with advanced disease with the same drugs, a few of which really worked. We know now that kidney cancer is not kidney cancer. Kidney cancer is a number of different types of cancer with different histologies, different clinical course, responding differently to therapy, and as we have shown, is caused by different genes. We know now that there are 18 different genes that cause kidney cancer. Now, when we started looking for, we thought, the gene for kidney cancer, we showed that in clear cell kidney cancer, which is 75% of all kidney cancer, that there was a consistent loss of a segment of the third chromosome, chromosome three, in tumor tissue, from patients, look, we show that here, patients with sporadic clear cell kidney cancer. So we showed there was a loss of a segment of chromosome three. And that suggested to us that there was a kidney cancer gene in that location. Now, this area was much too big to search at the time by genetic cloning and sequencing strategies. There was no human genome uh, map at the time. This was 15 years before the human genome was sequenced. So we shifted gears to studying families, cancer families, to identify kidney cancer genes. And even today, most of what we know about the genetic basis of kidney cancer, we've learned together by studying families with kidney cancer. And this evening, we're gonna talk about four different types of kidney cancer, hereditary kidney cancer and sporadic. And, and, and to show you what we learned about the genetic basis of regular non-hereditary kidney cancer. So we started off by studying a disorder called the hereditary form of clear cell kidney cancer called von Hippel-Lindau, or VHL. Now, VHL is a hereditary cancer syndrome in which patients affected individuals are at risk for the development of tumor in tumors in a number of locations, including, of course, the kidneys, where these patients are at risk to develop bilateral, multifocal, clear cell kidney cancer. Now, when we look carefully at the kidneys of patients with 
VHL, we find that they're at risk to develop up to 600 tumors per kidney. So in these patients, our surgery is not curative. What we're doing is we're setting back the clock. So when I first started out as a young attending at NIH and saw our first patients with VHL, the standard approach for small, for, for kidney cancer, even small kidney cancers in our field, particularly those that could recur, was to do a nephrectomy. So that's what I did. I did a bilateral nephrectomy on this patient and I'll never forget it. After that, I took him downstairs here at NIH to the hospital when he was leaving, putting him in a taxi cab, sending home, back home to Michigan for dialysis. And I said to myself, I'm never doing that again. So we started doing partial nephrectomies and we'd operate on these people and reoperate on them. And we said, look, these tumors persist, they recur. So we started then doing an approach of active surveillance where we, we didn't operate. We did surveillance on patients until the largest tumor reached three centimeters, at which time we recommended surgery. Now, over the past 32 years, although we have had patients develop metastatic disease, we've never had a patient develop metastatic disease when managed in this fashion, i.e. the largest tumor removed when it reached three centimeters. Now, these are lethal tumors. They can spread, they can metastasize, no question about it. But when these patients are watched and the largest tumor removed at three centimeters, again, to date, we have no metastasis. Now, we've managed over the years over 1,100 patients with VHL and performed eight, over 800 surgeries uh, on these patients. Now, in order to identify the gene for this disease, we brought patients to the National Institutes of Health. You can see here, you can see the main hospital be building there, the hospital called the NIH Clinical Center. We brought these patients, these families in. We conducted genetic linkage analysis to localize the VHL gene to the short arm, as you can see here, of chromosome three. We then did physical mapping with a number of colleagues, including Dr. my colleague, Dr. Burton Sabar, and we localized the VHL gene to this area here on the short arm of chromosome three, where we have where it says VHL, and we did physical mapping, and then in the spring, of 1993 identified the VHL gene, which is, as you can see here, a three exon gene. And we're looking for mutations that segregate with the disease. And that, of course, is what we found. We, to date, have found mutation in four, all 403 families. In other words, 100% of patients, 100% of families, we've detected VHL gene mutation. Now, next we wanted to see, was this the gene? It took us 10 years, by the way, to get to this point. Next, we wanted to see, how about regular, non-familial, sporadic clear cell kidney cancer? So we looked for mutation and loss of that gene. And that, of course, is what we found. We find mutation or methylation another way to inactivate the gene with silencing, in clear cell kidney cancer in over 90% of our patients. So VHL is the gene for clear cell kidney cancer. Now, when we look at other types of kidney cancer, such as type one papillary or type two papillary kidney cancer, we do not find mutation of the VHL gene. So this gave us the first indication of a precision approach to making the diagnosis of a certain type of kidney cancer by looking at the genetics. So next, we did a study with uh, really uh, the TCGA, Cancer Genome Atlas study, and we worked with 300 of the smartest people I've ever met in my life to do the TCGA 
molecular characterization of clear cell kidney cancer, which we published in Nature. And here we've showed, yes, in a large number of tumors, we do see mutation and methylation of the VHL gene in a high percentage of tumors from patients with clear cell kidney cancer. We also find other genes, and these other genes, these 12 other genes you see here we have listed, we call these the 13 SMGs or significantly mutated genes that we see in clear cell kidney cancer. And I wanna show you in particular, these three genes here that are on chromosome three, which as you recall, that's where we, we said the VHL gene is, a gene called PBRM1, another one set D2, and a third gene, BAP1. Now, these are important genes because they're mutated in a high percentage of clear cell kidney cancers along with the VHL gene. But I want you to remember the BAP1 gene because when that gene's mutated, you get a much worse phenotype. In other words, we found in this study, the TCJ study of clear cell kidney cancer, that when BAP1 was mutated, we saw that in high grade, high stage, low survival kidney cancers. Now, the VHL gene is what we call a tumor suppressor gene, a two-hit gene. So we showed way back in 1997, 1987, excuse me, that there is a deletion of this gene in clear cell kidney cancer. And of course, I've just shown you a mutation. So we call that a two-hit gene, mutation and deletion. Okay, so you say that is a tumor suppressor gene. When you lose that gene, you get cancer, right? Well, do you have any other data to prove that, to show that? Well, yes, we do. So when we take a clear cell kidney cancer from a patient with a VHL gene mutation, and we grow it in the laboratory and we put it in a mouse, it makes a tumor. Well, if we make one change, we put a normal copy of VHL back in those cells and put that in a mouse, we get no tumor. So this is a loss of function tumor suppressor gene. So the next question we had, and this was a totally novel gene, we found this, it was new. We had no idea how this gene functioned. So we started doing studies and we showed along with, along with the Kalin group, the Kalin's group, that VHL binds two other proteins. We made an antibody to VHL. You can see that on the left where it says rat VHL. And the two bands below VHL we sequenced. And those were two novel genes that were just being identified by Ron and Joan Conaway. And they were called Alongin C and Alongin B. So we had two proteins that bound the VHL protein that made a complex but that still didn't really help us understand how this gene was working, how it was causing kidney cancer. Well, the next study we did, and this is as with that, it's also with, with our colleague, Rick Klausner. We looked at gels and we pulled out a gel. And the first author on this paper was a scientist named Arnim Paws. And we pulled this band out here and sequenced that. And that turned out to be a, a gene that had just a part of a novel tumor suppressor gene family that had just recently been identified in yeast. It's called COL2, colon 2 And we could go back to yeast and you could see that COL2 in yeast is part of a complex that targets other genes for degradation. So the, it looked like the VHL gene complex therefore would be binding target proteins for degradation. Well, a couple years later, Peter Ratcliffe's group and Bill Kalin's group showed that the VHL complex was indeed targeting HIF, the hypoxia inducible factor. 
and that this was oxygen sensitive, that in normal oxygen, the VHL complex targeted HIF for degradation. But when the cells were short of oxygen, when they were hypoxic, the complex could not target HIF and HIF accumulated. Well, we still didn't know what the mechanism of that was until again, two years after that, these two landmark studies, again, by Ratcliffe and Caleb, showed that the mechanism was an enzyme called prolyl hydroxylase 2, PHD2. You can see that there in green. And when there is oxygen, PHD2, prolyl hydroxylase, puts hydroxyl groups on the target HIF, and then the VHL complex can target HIF and degrade it. However, if the cell is hypoxic, is short of oxygen, that you can't put the hydroxyl groups on, HIF accumulates. And for this work, Bill Kalin, Peter Radcliffe, and Greg Semenza were awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize for how cells sense and adapt to oxygen, oxygen availability. So in other words, the VHL gene, VHL gene complex is an oxygen sensor. So what we showed was when VHL is mutated, either it can't bind the complex or can't bind HIF, either way, it doesn't matter. Even if there's normal oxygen, it's like the cell thinks it's short of breath, it's short of oxygen, and HIF accumulates even in normal oxygen levels. And HIF is a transcription factor that targets things like VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor alpha. This we can understand as urologic surgeons, our tumors are vascular, are vascular. They don't stop growing. So this then provided the foundation for the development of now nine drugs targeted, approved by the FDA that target the VHL HIF pathway for treatment of patients with advanced kidney cancer. So that's how these work, drugs work. They target the VHL HIF pathway. Well, we wanted to do better. We wanted to develop more precision therapies. So why can't we target HIF itself? So our group, and again, and again, the Kalin group showed that HIF-2 is a critical part of the VHL HIF pathway and knocking out HIF-2 degradation is sufficient to make clear cell kidney tumors. So this work was published in 2002. And over the last 18 or so years, we've seen the development of agents that target HIF-2. And the first one out is an agent called Belsudafan, which used to be called MK6482, which targets HIF-2. And we've now seen a multi-center trial, which is also going on here, with Belsudafan targeting kidney cancer in patients with VHL and has been presented at a number of meetings, we're seeing very dramatic response. Almost all of the tumors get smaller with targeting HIF-2 and up to 35% in the first analysis of tumors are an official partial response. This drug is also being looked at to treat patients with metastatic clear cell kidney cancer. And in work that was just published in Nature Medicine, Tony Cherry and others also are seeing responses in patients with advanced clear cell kidney cancer. The initial study was done in patients who failed everything else, but they're seeing responses in at least 25, dramatic responses, partial responses in at least 25%. So we're very encouraged about this and hopeful that, that we'll be able to see the development of even more effective forms of therapy for clear cell kidney cancer, and we're waiting for the day in which we can see the development of effective forms of therapy for every patient 
with advanced as well as localized clear cell kidney cancer. So I've shown you clear cell is VHL gene and a number of ways to target that pathway. But, yeah, but how about other types of kidney cancer, non-clear cell kidney cancer? So we'll talk about papillary, chromophobe, and type two papillary kidney cancer. And we'll start with type one papillary kidney cancer. So if you think about sporadic hereditary, just regular type one papillary kidney cancer, what do we know about the genetics of that? How can we target that? Well, again, what we know about the genetic basis of type one papillary kidney cancer, we've learned from studying hereditary kidney cancer. So this was the disease we described called hereditary papillary renal carcinoma or HPRC. It runs in families, autosomal dominant. These patients can get bilateral multifocal type one papillary renal cell cancer. And when you look closely at these patients' kidneys, they get up to 1,100 small tumors. Now, again, we developed a surgical management approach for patients with type one papillary renal cancer with MET mutations in which, just like VHL, in which we recommend surgical intervention when the largest tumor reaches the three centimeter threshold. And again, after 28 years now, we have not yet had one patient develop metastatic disease when managed in this fashion. This, by the way, is also how we manage patients at the NCI who we see with bilateral multifocal sporadic type one papillary kidney cancer, which you can see not infrequently. Type one papillary is very often multifocal. So that's how we manage those patients. Now, we wanted to find the gene for this disease. So we brought patients in, again, families to the NIH. We did genetic analysis and localized the gene for hereditary papillary renal carcinoma to chromosome 7 and we localized it to the long arm of chromosome seven seen here, looked at a number of candidates and the candidate for hereditary papillary renal cell carcinoma turned out to be MET. And MET is the cell surface receptor for the growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor, HGF. And what we find in these families and these patients is activating mutation of MET in the HPRC patient. Now MET, we said VHL is a tumor suppressor gene, a two hit loss of function gene. MET of course is an oncogene where you get a single change, a mutation in MET that causes hereditary papillary renal carcinoma. So we've evaluated 60 patients from 16 families and found MET mutation in each of those patients. Now, we then wanted to see if we could target MET in these patients. So we did a clinical trial, and this was a multi-center trial conducted at the NCI under the leadership of Dr. Ram Srinivasan, who treated patients with ferretinib, which is a dual MET and VGFR inhibitor. And this is the kind of thing we saw. So this patient is the first patient we saw with hereditary papillary renal carcinoma. We didn't at the time, this was in 1992, in the spring of 92, we didn't know, I didn't know the difference between hereditary papillary renal carcinoma type one and type two, which we'll show you in a minute, which is a very aggressive form of kidney cancer. And I took out, when we saw this patient, I took out his right kidney. Well, that was in May of 1992. In July of 1992, I did a partial nephrectomy on his left kidney and took out 19 tumors. Well, over the years, he continued to develop new tumors in that kidney. 
and in September of 2000, operated again for the second time on his solitary remaining left kidney and took out 59 additional tumors. Well, over the years, he again continued to develop new tumors and his largest tumor in that remaining right kidney got to be 3.4 centimeters. Well, Ram Srinivasan put him on foretinib. Well, after a few months, he came back. We reevaluated him, and that tumor, instead of being 3.4, was down to 2.5 centimeters. Well, the, the urologic oncology fellows at NCI said, well, Dr. Linehan, they said that patient's tumor has gone down to 2.5. That's less than three, so he's no longer surgical. I said, exactly. That's exactly what we're working toward, making kidney cancer a non-surgical disease. So Dr. Srinivasan kept him on therapy. And after 49 cycles of therapy, we had to stop because he had some, he had some toxicity. We, we needed to stop the drug, but that tumor had gone from three, four down to the other tumors in the kidney were basically not detectable. And this got down to 1.4 centimeter, almost non-detectable. But when you looked at all of the tumors, the 39 tumors in the HPRC patients, the target lesions, as you can see here, every single one of those tumors got smaller. So are we home yet? No, we're not home yet, but we're in the, going in the right direction. So you might say, well, okay, got that. Now, but how about patients that don't have one of these hereditary syndromes. How about patients, the common form of just regular, sporadic, non-familial, you know, type one papillary kidney cancer? What, what do you know about that as far as genetics? Well, that's a good question. So we looked at that again with, an, again with, with looked at the cancer genome atlas, TCGA, the molecular characterization of papillary kidney cancer. And again, with 300 of really the smartest people I've ever worked with. And we published this in 2016. And looking at type one papillary kidney cancer, MET is very important. So we found MET RNA levels in type one papillary kidney cancer much higher than in type two. So the type one patients, the, the MET, activation went up and we saw fossil MET was increased as well as the MET level. And when we looked at MET mutation, splicing or fusion, plus looking at amplification, increased copy number, we found that in 81% of the tumors. So MET is very important in sporadic type, type one papillary kidney cancer as well as the hereditary type of the disease. Now, how about other types of kidney cancer such as chromophobe kidney cancer? So we started off looking at chromophobe kidney cancer by studying patients with Bert Hogg Dubé or BHD. Now, BHD is a cancer, it's a hereditary syndrome that was described by Bert Hogg and Dubé in which patients have, are affected with cutaneous lesions, you can see here, that are what are called fibrofolliculomas. Now these are benign, small, they're really hair follicle tumors that Bert, Hogg, and Dubé described in 1997, 1977, and this is now called BHD or uh, Bert Hogg Dubé syndrome. Now we and others have shown that BHD patients, this is important for you to know, also have lung cysts. Nearly 90% of our patients have lung cysts. You can see here a few of these we've operated on. And we showed that these patients also get kidney tumors, which can be solitary They can be bilateral, multifocal, they can be large, these can metastasize, these, can, these are, are malignant cancers. And when we look at the pathology of these, we find 
that there are of mixed pathology. You can find chromophobe, hybrid oncocytic tumors, clear cell, and occasionally we can see oncocytomas. Now we can see those different types of tumors all in the same family, sometimes in the same patient, sometimes in the same kidney. Now, how do we manage these surgically? Well, we've developed an approach of active surveillance until the largest tumors reach three centimeters, at which time we recommend surgical intervention when the largest tumor reaches three. And again, since 1997, so that's been 24 years now, to date, we have not had one patient develop metastatic disease when managed in this fashion. So for VHL, clear cell, type one papillary with HPRC, and chromophobe kidney cancer with BHD, all three centimeters. Now, again, we wanted to find the gene for this disorder so we could understand it, make the diagnosis better in the families, and we wanted to develop a therapy. So we brought patients to NIH, brought families, we did genetic linkage analysis, localize this gene to the short arm of chromosome 17. In this area here, we mapped and mapped and mapped. And then finally, in 2002, identified the BHD gene, which we call folliculin or FLCN. And folliculin is a fort, big gene, it's a 14 exon gene. And we find mutations actually going throughout the gene and just about all of the exons uh, in nearly 100% of our BHD families. We've evaluated now uh, over, actually now over 500 patients with BHD and found mutations of folliculin in 98% of the family. So we wanted to work on developing therapies for these patients. And so we wondered what kind of gene is BHD, is folliculin? Is it a, a tumor suppressor gene like VHL or is it an oncogene like MET? And what we found is that it's a tumor suppressor gene like VHL. So we looked for mutation in the tumors, but also loss. And what we find is loss and mutation of the second allele. In other words, both copies of the gene are mutated. Folliculin is a tumor suppressor gene, just like VHL is. And if you look at multiple tumors, you find different second hits in each one of them, they are independent. Now, how on earth does this gene work? We talked about VHL being an oxygen sensor, and we talked about MET for type one papillary kidney cancer. How about folliculin? But what we've shown is that folliculin is a metabolic gene like VHL is, and that folliculin is the, one of the body's main amino acid sensors. It's very important for sensing amino acids. So that's number one. Number two, folliculin regulates the function of two other cancer genes we'll talk about next, TFE3 and TFEB. So when folliculin is mutated in BHD and BHD kidney tumors, what happens is TFE3 and TFEB are activated. And we now know from the elegant work of Andres Palabio, it was published in Nature just last fall, that TFEB drives the activation of mTOR. So we showed that folliculin is an amino acid sensor and that mTOR is activated. And what we now know is that the reason it's activated is because of TFEB and, and TFE3. So we're now currently working on on approaches to targeting the TFEB, TFE3 pathway for treatment of patients with BHD. So next, I wanna introduce another, actually the types of kidney cancer, it's called the MIT family, 
which is TFE3, TFEB, and MITF. So this started, this whole thing started, at least for us, in the, uh, in the 1980s. In 1987, I operated on a young woman, a 21-year-old, who came uh, from the Midwest, and she had this tumor in her left kidney. I took this out, but even so, she still went on to die nine months later in January of 1988. And I asked Maria Marino, our great pathologist, what kind of kidney cancer is this? She said, Marston, it's papillary kidney cancer. So we didn't know anything else about it other than that it was an unusual type of kidney cancer. And we took those cells from her surgery, actually, and we grew them in the laboratory and we showed that there was a translocation of part of chromosome one to the X chromosome. And then in 1996, we showed that what happens is that the gene from chromosome one, which we called PRCC, because we thought that was the papillary kidney cancer gene, it wasn't. But that translocated to drive a gene called TFE3. And that's what was causing the kidney cancers. We now call this TFE3 kidney cancer. So this has a characteristic pathologic phenotype. And what your, what your pathologist can do is stain for TFE3. And you'll see TFE3 staining in the nucleus as I'm showing you here. But sometimes it's hard to tell. And what you really want your pathologist to do, if you have a, a patient with kidney cancer that's uncharacterized, you're not sure what it is, the pathologist is not sure what it is, ask him to do a FISH test. And so here I show you a FISH test for TFE3 kidney cancer. And it very clearly shows the translocation from, in this case, chromosome one to the X chromosome. Now, we can see this very frequently in young people. This is a 12-year-old who has TFE3 kidney cancer. And we know that this is also more aggressive. This is a 23-year-old we saw, a law student who we saw came up here from the South. And she presented with this two centimeter mass in her left kidney, you can see here. But unfortunately, when she presented, she already had positive hyalur nodes. You can see here with this two centimeter small renal mass, she already had positive metastasis, positive nodes in the hilum. Now that's TFE3 kidney cancer. There's another type of related kidney cancer called TFEB, which was described in 2003 by David Fisher, Dr. Fisher at, um, up in Boston at Dana-Farber. And this is on chromosome six. It's, a, it's the same family as TFE3. And this is called TFEB kidney cancer. This is an 18 year old female we saw with TFEB kidney cancer. This is a 14 year old. You also see this in children and young adults. And this again is a very characteristic type of pathology, an eosinophilic uh, type of kidney cancer histology. And your pathologist many times will tell you that this stains positive for melon A. Now there's a third type of kidney cancer associated with this family, which is called MITF germline translocate germline uh, mutation kidney cancer. You can see this in families. We reported and really did the first sort of com comprehensive characterization of that, uh, showing a family and showing the pathology that it's multifocal. We published this just this spring uh, in urology that you can see a papillary and clear phenotype there in multifocal bilateral disease. Now, we do not recommend active surveillance. So this is different than VHL, HPRC, or BHD. We do not recommend active surveillance for TFE3 kidney cancer because these can spread when they're small. So we do not recommend delaying surgery 
and we recommend wide surgical margins. Now, TFE3, TFEB kidney cancer causes 42% of kidney cancer in children and young adults. So this is wild. I wouldn't call it rare. It's, it's an uncommon kidney cancer, but certainly not in children and young adults. So when you see a young person with kidney cancer, this is the first thing you should think of. Now, again, how about in adults? So in the TCGA study we talked about a minute ago, we looked at TFE3 and TFEB kidney cancer. This is really a form, we say it's a form of type two papillary kidney cancer. And that this, that this represented 12% of kidney cancers in children and young adults. We found TFEB kidney cancer in that study in a patient 64 years old and a patient who was 71. So it's not, my message here is it's not just children. So the last thing I wanna show you is a form of, of type two papillary kidney cancer associated again, we learned about this by studying families. And in the uh, 1990s, we reported in the early descri initial description of a very aggressive form lethal form, I'm sad to say, you can see in these two families, uh, we reported in 95, with a very aggressive form of type two papillary kidney cancer. We know now these patients are at risk to develop cutaneous and uterine lyomyomas. You can see here the cutaneous lyomyomas. These are little muscle tumors that occur in the, the hair follicle muscle called the erector pili. So normally, this is the muscle that contracts when you get cold or a big fright or something. People get what they call goosebumps. That's this. Now those, of course, go away, but not here. In this, when I'll show you, this is caused by the FH gene. And in patients who have a mutation of this in the germline, they get these cutaneous lyomyomas. It's these muscles think, for example, that it's, they think that it's always cold and they just keep contracting. And this is what you can get. And these can be very painful for these patients. You see them on the, on the chest, on the back, sometimes on the neck and the face. And these are cutaneous lyomyomas in HLRCC. These patients also, the women, the ladies, can also get uterine lyomyomas. And so if you see a patient or a family that has kidney cancer and has uterine or cutaneous lyomyomas, don't forget to think about HLRCC. So these patients are also at risk for a very aggressive form of kidney cancer. This was the first patient known with this disorder. This is a young woman, an 18 year old, came up here again from the South, from Charlottesville with this kidney tumor. I took this out in May of 1989. She lived only seven months after that and she died of metastatic disease. Her mother died 17 months after that. We lost this family. We lost contact, we couldn't find them, didn't find them again for 18 years. And during that time, we went on to lose eight members of this family with aggressive kidney cancer. This was the second patient I saw, the 21 year old who came up here from, of Cuban descent from Miami, had the 21 year old, excuse me, had this large left renal tumor. I took this out, took out, we thought all the tumor from his vena cava, but he recurred and died 17 months after that of metastatic disease. Now, this is a 32-year-old that I saw uh, who came, uh, you can see these cutaneous lesions here on his chest. His father had died of metastatic kidney cancer at age 35. He came to us at age 32 with this left renal cyst and inside the cyst, he had a small renal tumor that was one half centimeter, one half centimeter. 
However, when he presented, he had a hyalur node that was positive for papillary kidney cancer. So this spread when it was one half centimeter. In other words, these have a propensity to test spread when the primary tumors are small. This is a type of very aggressive type of type two papillary kidney cancer. And your pathologist will tell you that these have orangophilic nucleoli with perinucleolar halos. It's very characteristic. Now, this is a 24 year old that we saw who presented with these two small lesions. These patients are at risk to get cysts in the kidney, tumors I showed you, but also tumors inside cysts. So this young woman who was 24 presented with this cyst in her left kidney and these two small lesions. We operated on this patient and went way wide, almost up to the hilum. And when we, and we got this out, Maria Marino, our wonderful pathologist, called me and she said, Marston, you've got to come look at this. I said, what do you have, Maria? She said, look at this. You have this young woman, had the 24-year-old, had tumor inside the cyst. I said, well, I, that's, what I thought. that's what I thought. That's why we operated. She said, but look at this. You've got that tumor is infiltrating all the way up into the normal kidney. And I said, oh, Maria, don't tell me I've got positive markers there. She said, no, 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 you went very wide. But this tumor infiltrates into normal renal parenchyma, very different than clear cell, type one papillary or chromophobe renal cancer. I said, Maria, I know that. I said, you know, the problem is we can't see it on imaging and we can't see it grossly. But we know if you spill tumors, that's big trouble. We also know that even small tumors can be very aggressive. So this is a 17 year old that was operated for these small renal masses. She had two small tumors and we looked at the path. And again, I went over this with, with Dr. Marino and she said, look at this. She had positive tumor at the margin there at the CAMSA with that really small eight mil seven millimeter tumor. I said, right. And she said, look at this. Already it's invading into the normal renal parenchyma. I said, right. So we also know that you can see tumors in young people. We have a number of teenagers. You can see that we've had a number of these in 10-year-olds. This patient had multiple tumors in cysts at 10 years of age. We also know this is lifelong risk. Look at this patient. This is a 77-year-old with a tumor, her first tumor. So again, with these, we developed a surgical approach. Do not do active surveillance. Screen these people every year, and we do not like to do robotic surgery on these. We go open on these, and we do wide surgical margins. So we've developed an approach of surgical management. Some of, some of our director, Dr. Dr. Sharpless said, Marston, you're doing precision surgery here. I said, well, you know, I, I guess you could say that. So we recommend for patients with VHL, chromosome three translocation, BAP1, kidney cancer, HPRC and BHD, active surveillance. We do primarily robotic surgery on these until the largest tumor reaches three centimeters. However, people with other types of kidney cancer, like I showed HLRCC, uh, translocation TFE3, TFEB, we do not recommend uh, surveillance. We recommend surgery. Uh, we go, depending on which it is, we go open a robotic, but HLRCC, we go open and we do wide surgical margins. Now for HLRCC, we and others localized the gene to chromosome one and showed it's the gene for the Krebs cycle enzyme fumarate hydratase or FH. So we've characterized it in families and evaluated over 500 patients uh, with HLRCC from 280 families and detected FH mutation in 98%.
So we said to ourselves, how on earth does mutation of the gene for a Krebs cycle enzyme lead to kidney cancer? So what we have shown in a number of reports is that when fumarate hydratase is knocked out, the Krebs cycle is inactivated. These patients then oxidative phosphorylation is impaired. And so these tumors switch to aerobic glycolysis and they're very dependent on sugar for their rapid growth and development. So they switch to importing a lot of glucose, a lot of sugar. So we can detect that on PET scan. They're very PET positive. You can see here, here a patient of ours had a hepatic metastasis. And we have shown that when fumarate hydratase is knocked out, FH is mutated, that fum which fumarate hydratase takes you from fumarate to malate. So when FH is mutated, knocked out, fumarate accumulates, it goes up. And fumarate, we and others have shown, is an oncometabolite. And it poisons proleal hydroxylase. So as I showed you a minute ago, VHL targets HIF, but by virtue of proleal hydroxylase. Here, we have a VHL independent mechanism for dysregulation of HIF degradation in fumarate hydratase deficient kidney cancer in HLRCC. So, F, so HIF accumulates and HIF drives the transcription of more VEGF. So these patients need the vasculature, these tumors, the vasculature, and they need GLUT1 and GLUT4, which, this, which HIF drives, and that helps bring in sugar. So with ROM Cernovacin, again, we developed an approach to therapy using Bevacizumab, which targets VEGF, and Erlotinib, which targets glucose transport and glycolysis. So again, we developed an approach to therapy with bevacizumab and erlotinib in patients with metastatic HLRCC kidney cancer. Now, up to this point, I lost every one of these patients. We had no therapy that had any, really any significant effect on these patients. Now, Romsonovacin has presented our data showing 65, very dramatic responses, 65% of patients with partial response and overall response with stable disease of 35%. So we see 65% response and 35% stable disease. Now, this is the kind of response we're seeing, as you can see here, in this patient who developed cancer after he had a a, a nephrectomy developed recurrent disease in his retroperitoneum, 58 year old man from North Carolina. Romson of Asin put him on bevacizumab and erlotinib. And when he came back four months after starting therapy, you can see on the right the dramatic response that he had. This patient, this, this image, this is a PET scan. We talked about they're very, very PET positive. And on the left, you can see before treatment, the red in the retroperitoneum, all that recurrent disease after the left nephrectomy. But on four months of therapy, you can see the dramatic response that we've seen. So what I've shown you is that kidney cancer is not kidney cancer. It's a number of different types of cancer, different histologies, different clinical course, responding to different therapies, and caused by different genes. So it's hope, our hope that understanding the genetic basis of kidney cancer will lead to effective forms of therapy for all patients with this disease and that it will help us as urologic surgeons improve our management of patients with kidney cancer.
I also want to acknowledge a number of my colleagues that work with us on kidney cancer, Dr. Mark Ball, who directs our surgical approach, Dr. Ramaprasad Srinivasan, who directs our therapeutic, our molecular therapeutic approach. Also very much my colleague, Dr. Peter Pinto, who worked with so many years on kidney cancer, and of course, we work on prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Vladimir Valera, uh, who also has worked with us on our kidney cancer, directs our bladder cancer programs, and the world's best group of urologic oncology fellows who helped with all of the work that I've shown you here today. So thank you very much. And the, the sponsor of this uh, lecture series, I would like you to share your thoughts by taking this survey. Thanks again. Really enjoyed being with you.